I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Whoa, holy mackerel, that is I a huge snake. Here, hold the tongs here. Grab, 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 grab now. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't want to let go of it. Oh, I didn't know I let go. There's an old saying. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. When it comes to featuring the elusive timber rattlesnake, this saying seems to be our team motto. Oh my gosh. The terrain that we traverse looking for rattlesnakes is a challenge unlike anything we've really ever done before. And this is our third venture out looking for timbers and it never gets any easier. As the sun is really beating down on us. You can see all this distance down behind me. These mountainsides are what we essentially scale, looking for these perfect clusters of rocks where the snakes will be out and sunning. It takes a toll on your body, that's for sure. I'm gonna catch up to Tim and Mario. This hike is definitely testing our will to find these snakes. Today we have gained special permissions to explore what is known as a right-of-way that was built several years ago during the insertion of a natural gas pipeline. Upon initial installment, this type of construction would have had an adverse impact on the local wildlife. Yet beyond construction, it has become an ideal habitat for many species. Insanely steep, brush covered, and strewn with a jumble of various rock sizes, this is now the perfect safe haven for our sought after target, the timber rattlesnake. Wow. I mean, we're always talking about how beautiful West Virginia is, but when you make it to the top of a bluff like this, check out the view. That is something. My goodness. Wild and wonderful West Virginia right there. Endless miles of possible snake territory. But are we gonna find one? That's the real question. Once again, we have teamed up with wildlife expert, Tim Brust. You likely recognize Tim from a variety of episodes on the Brave Wilderness channel, but it's truly the timber rattlesnake that we can define as his specialty. Currently, Tim has been conserving these snakes by mitigating human-snake interactions. Simply put, he explores the areas that are about to go into construction, finds, and safely moves these reptiles from the path of bulldozers. During this process, he also educates field crews about these misunderstood animals, which helps to keep the snakes alive and the humans safe from having an unwanted venomous encounter. We are going down at a pretty considerable angle right now in our search for timber rattlesnakes. Now, a lot of this environment has this crumbled flat rock, right? All of this, this almost like sheet rock. So we're lifting up these giant pieces of rock and looking beneath them for snakes. You hear that? It is completely hollow underneath this rock and it's very big, which means there's no chance of flipping it. But I came down and I scouted this after walking over it and look at this. That right there is an absolute perfect spot for a timber rattlesnake to be hiding. Now you would never want to stick your hand up and underneath a rock like that to sift through the leaves. A bite from a timber rattlesnake could definitely kill you. It's just a matter of covering ground and searching, searching, searching. The more ground we cover, the better the chances we have of finding a snake. The Western Hemisphere is home to 32 different rattlesnake species. And in my opinion, the timber rattler is one of the most iconic. We have been trying for years to share this species with you. But today, things are about to change. So Tim and Mario are ahead of me. They just call out, they found a timber rattlesnake. Making my way as fast as I can down this rocky slope. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, this is it. We've got a timber rattlesnake. Yes! Oh my gosh, that snake is beautiful. Okay, sounds like we've got two snakes. So what we're doing is just bagging the snake for the moment to see if we can get the bigger one. A really big snake, really big snake. All right, what do you need me to do, Tim? Whoa, holy mackerel, that is a huge snake. We, it's, it, we can't. 
can't. Here, hold the tongs here. You got it. Yep. Watch out. Here's the head body here. Be really careful. There's other snakes in the area. So what's happening right now is we've got a very big snake underneath this rock. Careful, it's a very dangerous line. situation. You can see how steep it is right here. So we've got to be very careful. There are also other snakes within the rock. So we're going to slowly peel back pieces of these rocks and see if we can safely get the snake. Check it out. There are sheds of snake skin all over the place. We have found a hot spot. It's been quite the hike to get to this spot, but we have finally got a timber rattlesnake. Several of them out here. The other one? It's a big snake. Oh my god. Hold him, hold him, hold him. Wow, that is a huge rattlesnake. Okay, do we have another bag with us? Yep. Okay. In total, we were able to secure three snakes, one of which appeared to be a gravid female. This is incredibly exciting for the future of this population. Beautiful. And to ensure she does not get stressed, we immediately release her back into the rock. Don't want to get any closer than that. How about that, Mario? We finally got our timber. <laughs> we got multiple timbers. Oh my gosh. That is a good sized snake. All right, so what we're going to do is actually put the snake in a snake bag at the moment. It is definitely a big snake, but we can't film right here. We have to take it to a slightly more controlled setting. So we're going to safely bag it, move it, and then bring it back down here for the release. When you're bagging a snake, you always want to secure it at the back side of the bag with the snake hook. Snake skin. That means this is a healthy population of rattlesnakes that hang out in this area here. We've hit the rattlesnake mother load, that's for sure. <laughs> With the two other snakes contained, we begin the arduous climb back up the steep sides of the right of way. This is a very slow and very delicate process. Mario, are you doing okay? Actually, I tell you what, it's really hard on the forearm. You gotta keep the snake well away from your body so it doesn't swing on you. Snakes can bite easily through the bags, and most people are venomated when they're transporting snakes like this, so you have to be very careful. There's the snakes. That's where we came from. And that is where we're still going. Whew. A lot of effort, but totally worth it. There it is, the timber rattlesnake. This is our third attempt at finding one of these reptiles in the wild, and my goodness, is this one handsome. Now, the name timber rattlesnake comes from the fact that you find these snakes in forested areas, and they are cryptic. And lets you know exactly what it is that you're looking for, your odds of seeing one are rather pretty slim. Unless you stumble upon it and it gives you that warning of its rattle, you may walk right past it. Now, as compared to the other rattlesnake species here in the United States, I'd actually consider this species rather docile. Their defense is always going to be to rely on their camouflage first. If you get too close, this is exactly what you're going to hear. That rattle going into full action, basically a security system that says, you're too close, get any closer, and you may take a bite. You can see how close I am to the snake right now, just about a foot and a half from it. I don't want to make any sudden movements and provoke it too striking, but it definitely senses that I'm here. And the rattlesnake is the pinnacle of snake evolution. What I want you guys to really take a look at are the heat sensing pits right in front of the eye and right below the nostril that allow these snakes to pick up the heat signatures of their prey. Basically, all they need to do is lay in wait as an ambush predator for something to come close. Their tongue will flick out, they will sense the chemicals, the smell of that prey item, and then with those heat sensing pits, they can hone in almost like a heat seeking missile and then strike out with those hinged fangs. Remember, the fangs are like hypodermic needles and the second they inject that venom, that prey item has pretty much no chance of surviving. Now, if it's something like a small rabbit or a rat, a chipmunk, a squirrel, and it runs off, the snake will actually follow the scent of that prey item until it succumbs to the venom, and then it's capable of swallowing down its meal. And those fangs work individually of one another, and they will almost use those like grappling hooks to drag their prey backwards into their mouths. Now, the fangs are modified teeth, 
but all snakes have multiple rows of teeth within their mouth that are constantly being replaced throughout the course of the snake's life. So as the fangs draw the prey in, the other teeth work it back down the throat and they swallow their prey whole. Now, as compared to other rattlesnake species in the United States, I would say the timber rattlesnake is more ambush than it is nomadic. They will always lay in wait, waiting for their prey to come to them. Any small mammals or small amphibians that they come across within the forested environment make perfect prey. And a snake of this size, which measures, I would guess, just a little over three feet in length, is considered a full-grown adult. You may be saying to yourselves, Coyote, you guys are so good at being able to come across animals. How come it's taking you so many attempts to find the timber rattlesnake? This species specifically has been persecuted beyond what other rattlesnakes have even faced. A lot of times people will come across the den, which is known as a hibernaculum. Once they see this, a huge collection of snakes, what they will do is sometimes dump concrete or gasoline and burn these snakes or bury them alive. So you can wipe out an entire population of snakes by doing something like that. So seeing one of these snakes, actually several of them like this in the wild, in a very difficult to reach spot is a very positive thing. It means that the population is thriving. Nothing makes us more excited than to see a thriving population of timber rattlesnakes. Oh, this is just such a cool reptile. Now the next most important thing that we need to do is actually collect the biometrics of this snake. And to do that, what we're gonna do is gently get it into a snake tube. This will put the least amount of stress on the snake and will be the safest scenario for both myself, Tim, and the crew to be able to handle the snake. What I also wanna do is get a more up close look at that rattle. Because when it comes to rattlesnakes, nothing is more impressive than that defense system. All right, snake is on the move. All right, Tim, so what would you like me to do to help with this part of the procedure? And these guys, you want to gently direct their head into the tube. Got it. When he goes in, just set the tube at an angle if you can downward. Okay. Sometimes it takes 30 seconds, sometimes it takes 20 minutes. Grab, 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 grab now, quick, quick, quick. Push him in, push him up. There you go. Two on the tube, two on the snake. Woo! That was not easy. Wow, that is a powerful snake. My goodness. With the snake safely tubed, Tim and I are able to quickly collect the biometrics, which include the snake's total length, scale count below the cloaca to determine the reptile's sex, and finally, a rattle button count. This doesn't tell us anything specifically scientific, it's just cool to compare rattle sizes. That rattle is one of the most unique aspects of this snake. And the rattle itself is actually made out of modified scales. You can actually see the way that it's growing out of the tip of the rattlesnake's tail itself. Now inside its tail are a bunch of very specialized muscles that allow the tail to vibrate at a very high rate, which causes the rattle to actually rattle. So I can rattle it myself like that, or if I let go of those muscles, the rattlesnake will rattle it on its own. Now the rattle is made out of something known as keratin, the same material that the scales are made out of and the same thing that your hair and your fingernails are made out of. People always wanna know, well, what's inside the rattle of a rattlesnake? Truth be told, nothing at all. They're actually interlocking segments that are hollow. They're known as buttons, and when they vibrate against each other, that is where you get the rattling sound. Now, you cannot tell the age of a rattlesnake by the number of buttons. People often think that like the rings of a tree, if you count those buttons, you can tell how old the snake is. That is not true because throughout the course of the snake's life, it can lose segments of its rattle. But a new button comes into place every single time this snake sheds its skin. Now, this snake here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 buttons on that rattle. Honestly, this is the largest rattle I've ever seen on any of the rattlesnakes we have featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. Truly a unique aspect of this snake's evolution that makes it so incredibly distinct as compared to any other snake around the world. Well, how cool is this, spending an unbelievable amount of time searching for and finally finding the timber rattlesnake. Together, Tim and I worked out of scene to collect biometrics on the other big snake. It was robust and as healthy as a rattlesnake could be, which was a great sign for this thriving population. 
no two snakes are ever the same. And considering the timber rattler comes in such a wide variety of color faces, it's pretty cool to see just how different individuals are, especially when compared side by side. Finally, we hiked back down to the point of discovery and released both snakes into their corresponding rock crevices. The future of rattlesnakes, and all snakes for that matter, is always tangled up in a series of uncertainties that center around an unnecessary fear of these misunderstood reptiles. Yet it's conservationists like Tim Brust and the tireless work he does to help people understand the importance of these creatures that will ensure they continue to slither across the planet. What do you got? OK, well, uh, the homeowners, they, they don't want to be filmed, so they're just going to stay inside and probably watch us from the windows. OK. Uh, but they said, have at it said the snake was somewhere over here. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all we got going for us. Uh, but they're more than happy to have us here searching. So let's go look. OK, great. OK, so what I say we do is split up. Uh, which direction you want to go? I want to go that way first. OK, I'll go that way. If you see something, call it out. We'll all converge together. And with any luck, we're going to catch and relocate a snake. All right, let's get a snake. Here we go. So my reasoning for going in this direction is because this is a star apple tree. Check that out. Very fragrant fruit. All this fruit needs to be eaten by something. So what happens is rodents and other species will come to eat the fallen fruit and maybe there might be snakes in ambush waiting for them. Now, believe it or not, sometimes looking up underneath vehicles is a great place to look because they provide shade and shelter, especially if a car hasn't moved in quite some time. Let me do this. Yeah, there's a big snake. Ugh. I'd easily be able to see if it was hiding up underneath a vehicle like this. Most snakes are nocturnal. So now that it's daytime, the snake is likely going to be hunkered down somewhere. So the next step is to find things to flip, uh, debris, tin, wood, anything that a snake can hide underneath. And hopefully there is something underneath. Oh man, look at this. I thought this was snake skin. Snakes are potentially arboreal out here. We have tree boas out here. We have lots of different um, parrot snakes, vine snakes. So it is always a good idea to look up in the rafters to see if there's anything. Look at this. That right there could be a possible entry point, likely for rodents, also accessible for snakes. Whoa, that's actually some water. Yeah, if I was a snake hiding during the day, this would, oh, I just heard something. Oh, there's all kinds of tap holes. Water down in here. Oh, what would have been amazing is if I walked into this abandoned swimming pool and just found a snake curled right up in the water. I was thinking that that might be it. This looks pretty good. We got a uh, I don't know, chicken coop or actually it's a thing full of wood. Lots of spaces for snakes to hide in. Boa, holy smokes. I did not even see it there. Holy smokes. Coyote! Yeah, we got a snake. You got a snake? And Mario just called, he's got a snake. Oh, gosh. Is it big? Holy cow, that is a big snake. Oh my gosh. Dude. It is a boa constrictor. Dude, I, I came around here. I didn't even see that snake was right there. Oh my gosh. Okay, we found the snake. It's big. They weren't kidding. 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this camera. Let's regroup ourselves. Uh, That's a big snake, dude. Big snake. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is a huge boa constrictor. Okay, so this is it. The moment we're going to engage with the snake and try to safely get it out of this box of logs. Mm. No idea how it's going to behave. Oh, oh, that's a hiss. Oh, and there we go. Whoa. Now the snake's in a position where there's no way I can make a reach for it. You can see it's completely in a defensive strike position and Getting my hand any closer than this could mean getting my fingers entrapped. And look at all these incredibly huge razor sharp teeth. That is intimidating. Good, 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 good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Get a hold of that snake. Whoa! That was close. Okay, cool. Snake is, yep, is out. Up. Go back in. There you go. 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 Unbelievable. That snake is all of five, maybe six feet in length. Look at the nub tail. tail. Wow. Check this out. Now, if I come on this side of the snake, you can really get an idea for just how big it is. Now, a boa is a non-venomous species, so I don't have to worry about taking a bite and being envenomated, but these snakes have a mouth full of teeth. They're actually like little razor blades turned backwards, and on the top of the skull, they have multiple rows of teeth. So when they grab onto their prey, it locks in place, and the skull's capable of expanding, and these snakes can swallow down prey that are many times larger than their own bodies. And this is what you would consider a full-grown female boa. That aggressive hissing is basically just saying, I'm a big snake, I'm intimidating, you don't want to get any closer. Got you. Okay. There we go. The coils like that. Yep, you have to keep her as straight as possible. Okay. Now it's important to keep the snake stretched out, otherwise it's going to completely constrict around me. Okay, I got you, I got you. The snake is extremely strong and I'm being as gentle as I possibly can. Okay, I'm gonna actually, if I shift my hand back just a tiny bit there, oh wow, she's got ticks all over her. Um, I'm gonna use my multi-tool to pull them off. <sighs> she's got a big one right on the side of her head here. Not this isn't gonna ticks. hurt at all. Oh, look at that, completely full of blood. That parasite is a really unhealthy thing for a snake like this. Right now, we're kind of just doing a little bit of a uh, service by hopefully getting rid of some some ticks, but otherwise, she would be fine with these uh, as is. As you can see, the coils around my leg, the snake has to feel comfortable. Once you engage the head, the snake has to be in defensive mode. That's when the snake is gonna be at, at its most aggressive. I do have to be aware of where those teeth are at at all points in time. The less pressure I put on her, the less constrained she feels. Yeah, you're getting constricted. That's a... We want to keep those coils spread out as much as we possibly can. Here's another tick. Okay. I'm full of ticks right now. I've gotten all the ticks off the top third of the snake. She looks pretty good. You want to stretch her out a little bit so that we can see the, the full length? There we go. That's pretty cool. That is a beautiful snake. Gorgeous. Uh, the good news for this boa is that because we were able to find it and safely catch it, we're now going to be able to relocate it to a much wilder area. All this human habitation, while it may provide good opportunities for this snake to get a meal, it actually puts it in the way of danger. I'm actually really thankful that these property owners said, hey, do you guys wanna come safely remove the snake? Because killing an animal like this is actually really detrimental to the environment. These snakes do an incredible amount of good by helping to balance the pest populations. Well, I'd say this was a success. We found the snake, and now we're going to be able to safely relocate it back out into the wild. As the sun cut through the tops of the cypress trees, I carefully made my way into the swamp. 
Every step counts when you're in the back country of South Texas. And as my boots slowly splashed through the dark water, my focus was completely in tune with the environment. I knew that it was only a matter of time before I would find the one reptile that most people are terrified of. Coyote, what are you looking for? Snakes, and nothing yet. You know, most people are out there and they're hiking and they stumble upon snakes when they don't expect to. Me, I'm always looking for them. But if you do come across one in the wild, it's really important to identify the species. A lot of times you have a non-venomous snake that will look like a venomous one. Unfortunately, these non-venomous snakes are then vilified as being venomous, and a lot of times they end up being killed. My goal today is to catch one non-venomous snake and one venomous snake so that we can show you the distinct differences between the two. It's a long search out here in the swamps. I'm not giving up. We are going to find some snakes. that this one is non-venomous. Bring up in the light, check that out. That is a broad-banded water snake. Woo, okay, that is half of the equation right there. Watch your GoPro, he's trying to bite you. Well, that's the safe one. Now we gotta find the moccasin. Woo, awesome, man, definitely got my thumb. A bite from this one, and I'm gonna be just fine. But the other snake we're looking for, the water moccasin, if that had tagged my thumb, we wouldn't be getting shots. We'd be on our way to the hospital. Look at that. Maybe get a little closer to the camera there. Oh. He's bitey. Beautiful snake. Okay, cool. Well, let's keep searching for moccasins. What you did not want to do is just accidentally step on a venomous snake. This is definitely moccasin territory. Moccasin right there. Okay, come up slow. Where? Right up against the side of that tree. Oh, I wow, see. look at how big it is. Um, okay, now this is the real deal. Stay back. <sighs> okay. Stay a couple steps back. Now, they usually move pretty slow. I'm gonna try to hook it and bring it up here under the path. You ready? Yep. Careful. from this snake. That one will send you to the hospital. Okay, bringing it up on the path here. Wow, okay, ooh, rattling the tail a little bit. That is a defensive sign, okay. Uh, 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 it should just stop for us. Come here, come here. There we go. All right, what we need to do now is just get the snake under control so that we can get it up close for the cameras. Let me move it back a little bit here. Ah, my nerves are going. Just looking into the water there, and that's how well these things camouflage. I just saw it out of the corner of my eye, just an obscure shape up against that cypress. And that's what these snakes will do. You don't often see them just slithering about like you would a water snake. They'll often be just like this, curled up in a ball somewhere, trying to stay camouflaged, trying to stay away from any potential predators. And then again, if you were gonna try to eat this snake, you better be quick, because if you're tagged by those fangs, you are going to be in a world of trouble. Now this is a water moccasin, but they are famously known as cottonmouths. And watch this, I'll get the snake to open its mouth and you'll see that white throat. Look at that. That is a defense, oh, see, look, you got the tail going now too, you see that? Mimicking a rattlesnake, saying, I am venomous. Yes, we know that you were venomous. I can actually see the fangs tucked back. Woo, I am <sighs> dripping. Bullets of sweat right now, let me back up a touch. Okay, well perfect, we have the two snake species that are indigenous to this habitat, a water moccasin and a broad-banded water snake. One venomous, one that is not. Stick around and we'll show you which is which. Check this out. 
completely calm now, considering the fact just a few minutes ago, this snake was doing everything it could to bite me and get away. This is the broad banded water snake. And look at this incredibly calm demeanor. Now I noticed the same thing with Lake Erie water snakes and Northern water snakes. At first, it's all about fight or flight. If they can't get away and you catch them, they immediately try to bite you. Now the good news for me, like I said before, is that this is a non-venomous species. So how big did the snakes get? I mean, are these snakes get as big as a northern water snake? Yeah, they do. I would say this is about average size for one of these snakes. It is, I'd say, about two and a half feet in length, uh, but they can grow to be about three and a half or four feet at a maximum size. Females are larger than the males, and uh, I do believe it's a male looking at its cloaca. Yeah, you're a handsome fella, aren't you? Now, these snakes are often misidentified. People see them near the water and they automatically think it's a water moccasin. This is a very common species all across the southeastern United States. And the reason people mistake it for a water moccasin is mostly the fact that A, it's right by the water, and B, the coloration. I'm gonna turn the snake just a little bit. You see all that dark brown that runs the length of the body, and then that faded banding looks just like a younger water moccasin. But then, of course, if you flip the snake over and look at its belly, look at all that copper checkering. You will not find that on a water moccasin. And not that you'd ever necessarily see the belly of the snake, but I just think that that's really, really cool looking. Oh, this is actually the first time I have caught this species of snake. And it is just so incredibly calm right now. I cannot believe how comfortable this snake has gotten with us. And we've only been handling it for a few minutes. Oh, but it did musk on me. There you go. See that white stuff on my hand right there? Oh, yeah, it stinks. That is another defense mechanism. Poop on a potential predator if it's trying to eat me. All right, but I'm not gonna eat you. Don't worry, we can just hang out and be friends. Wow, this snake is so cool. Well, I think at this juncture we should bring out the water moccasin. I'm gonna hand this snake off to Mario. He's gonna bring in the moccasin. This is gonna be a little bit more dangerous. Hopefully we'll get that snake to just calm down on the ground and we'll get the cameras up close for it so we can show you the distinct field markings of that snake. All right, you ready? Yep. All right, now we're gonna bring in the water moccasin. Uh, just keep your wits about you because this is going to be slightly more dangerous. Okay, let me bring her over here. Slightly is an understatement. Yeah. I got it, I got it, I got it. Let me get her to calm down. Hold on, let me get her to stop. Here we go. So, Coyote, the water snake you just held had anticoagulant in its saliva. This snake has venom. What would this snake do to you? This snake would, depending on how your body reacted, it could potentially kill you. There are not many reported deaths from water moccasin bites. However, that venom is incredibly toxic and it will break down your red blood cells. You could lose a finger, you could lose your hand. Let's just put it this way. If I'm tagged by this snake, we are leaving this scene and we are heading to the hospital. So I need to be extra careful right now. Mark, we've got you a couple feet past the snake. We've got Mario just off camera here, making sure the snake makes a move. He keep it away from you, Mark. But other than that, if we just stay calm and collected, just like this in front of the snake, we should be just fine. You see the snake's not trying to flee, it's just keeping itself low to the ground, it's body spread. Look how wide and girthy that snake is. Now, these snakes, like the banded water snakes, are aquatic. However, they do not dive down underwater to hunt. You will see them occasionally moving from pocket of water to pocket of water, but they usually are hunting on the embankment. These snakes do not have rattles like rattlesnakes, and they rely on their camouflage to keep them hidden. A lot of times, people will be walking down a trail, you accidentally step on the snake, and that's how you were bitten. This snake has no interest in chasing or hurting humans. If you just admire this animal from a safe distance, you're gonna be just fine. Okay, so the most important part of this episode is that we want to show you a comparison of this snake next to the broadbanded water snake. Now to do that, I'm going to have to get the water moccasin under control, which means I'm going to use my snake hook to gently pin its head and then pick the snake up. Mario's going to bring in the broadbanded water snake, we're going to put them side by side and show you the distinct field marks so that you can properly identify these snakes if you ever come across them in the wild. Gently going to get position of her head, just like this. There we go. I want my fingers just behind the head like that. Okay. This is the most dangerous thing you can do with a venomous snake. Yep. Never, ever, ever do what you see me doing here. I'll get full control of the body. There we go. 
Yeah, well, you notice my hand is shaking. Now, never, ever, ever try to pick up a venomous snake like you just saw me do. And the only reason that I headed this snake is so that we can get both of these right next to each other. I've got a gentle yet firm grip on the back of her head, just behind the venom glands, and full control of the body. You won't see me moving too much more for this scene. I just gotta kinda collect my nerves, stay calm. Uh, Mario, go ahead and bring in the broadband water snake. There we go. Cool. Look at a that. A little nervous? A little bit. <laughs> kind of have a dangerous snake here, Mahana. She's calmed down a bit. You can see her tongue's flicking out now, so that's good. She's not trying to expose her fangs. Now, the water moccasin, because it is a pit viper and it has these two massive venom glands, has a very triangular-shaped head. You pan over to the broad-banded water snake, and its head is actually very narrow. Mm -hmm. However, when these broad-banded water snakes are threatened, they will flatten their heads and puff them up, forming them into a triangle, which oftentimes causes people to misidentify them for water moccasins. It's good news for the snake if it drives off a predator, but it's bad news if that predator is a human, and then unfortunately that snake usually ends up being killed. Um, sorry, a little nervous. Um, let's look on the heads as well at the snake's eye. So I'm gonna just slightly turn I'll, I'll move, you, okay. you stay there. Okay. You'll notice that the water moccasin has a vertical pupil, while the banded water snake has a circular pupil. I don't imagine anybody out there watching is ever going to get face to face with either of these snake species, but if you happen upon one and you see a vertical pupil, you know it's a moccasin and you know that it's venomous. Now the last difference on the face of these snakes is the fact that the water moccasin is a pit viper. Now right up front there you'll see a nostril and just behind that you see another hole in between the nostril and the eye. That is the heat sensing pit which allows these snakes to detect not only their prey but potential predators in the environment. Now when you look at the broadbanded water snake you'll notice that it does not have pits, just eyes and nostrils. When you look at these two snakes overhead, you can see how similar they are in coloration. Now the broadband water snake has more distinct banding, but if you were to just see these snakes at a quick glance, they are pretty similar looking. But you'll notice that the water moccasin has a much girthier flattened body as compared to the banded water snake. Look at that difference right there. But their scales look similar. They do, don't they? And both species have rough keeled scales, which allows them to quickly be able to move through this rugged environment. Can we see the bellies? I know there's, that's another big difference. Yep. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Now, you would, you're never likely to see the belly of these two snakes next to each other, but as you can see, the banded water snake is beautiful and checkered, and the water moccasin is just kind of plain and cream colored. Not that that makes the snake any less special. I smell something, coyote. You do. I smell that same thing. Both of these snakes right now are musking, which is a final defense tactic in the event that something tries to eat them. That musk is coming out of their bottom ends, and if you're a predator and you get that in your mouth, it tastes really bad. So, as you can tell, these snakes have many different defenses against potential predators. For everyone out there watching, we want you to know that these two snakes are very difficult to distinguish from one another. And if you see a snake out there in the wild, definitely treat it as if it's venomous. If it's a moccasin and you take a bite, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So it's best to just always admire these animals from a safe distance. Working with snakes is one of the most dangerous aspects of this job. And the reason I do it is so that we can learn about these incredible animals and hopefully walk away with a newfound respect, or even the ones that we are afraid of. With the setting of the hot Florida sun comes the rise of its nocturnal predators. Some of these creatures, like the American alligator, are not the kind of foe you would ever want to stumble upon while out exploring in the Everglades. And despite the fact that alligators rarely attack humans, their natural instinct is to hunt under the cover of darkness. All the more reason to steer clear of their environments at night. On this humid evening, we are back en route towards civilization after filming a selection of sunset B-roll shots. Traveling the back roads at night, believe it or not, is actually a great place to stumble upon a variety of snake species that slither up from the swampy waters and onto the asphalt to absorb the daytime's remaining heat. Much to our delight, this is exactly the scenario we encountered, and you are now about to witness one of America's most dangerous snakes. Holy cow, okay. 
I got the GoPro rolling. Here Mario, go. get the lights. Get the lights. Give me that snake tong. We have got a huge water moccasin. Here, here, here. Give me this. Give me this. Here. It is right in the middle of the road. Go slow. Go slow. Mark, kill the car. Keep the lights on, though. Holy cow. That is the biggest water moccasin I have ever seen. Wow. Look at that snake. That thing is huge. All right, we're gonna wait until we've got the lights out. Massive water moccasin just in front of us here. You can't tell how big it is on the GoPro, but it is massive. That is a huge water moccasin. Oh, 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 he's starting to move. He's curling into a tighter ball. I'm gonna try to come on this side of it. That's exactly what we want right there. See how it's curling up into a tight little ball? Perfect defensive pose right there. Wow, that is a massive snake. That's the water moccasin for you right there. The quintessential cotton mouth. I'm definitely gonna keep my snake tongs in between me and the snake. These snakes are capable of striking up to three feet in length. It will lunge its entire body forward. You can see it's puffing itself up right now, trying to be bigger, saying, I'm a big snake. Yes, we are aware that you are a big snake. In fact, this is the largest water moccasin I have ever seen. Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the back of his tail there. See that little wiggling of the tail? Mimicking the movements of a rattlesnake, trying to warm me back up. I am agitated. You can see he's puffing up his body now. Woo! Woo! Did you see that? Yeah. I barely even moved, brought the snake tongs back and it struck at me. Look at the position that his head is in right now. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I just wanna test the distance of his strike here. See if he's gonna strike again. Okay. He's got his back to you, Mark, which is good for you. Not necessarily good for me. Oh, you see that? Another strike. Okay, I've kinda tested his limits. He's still got an okay shot there? Yeah. Look at how heavy body this snake is. There's no way you would mistake a water moccasin of this size for just a normal water snake. And oftentimes those two species are confused for each other. As you guys know, we've done an episode in the past, we've compared the water moccasin to the water snake. And at that point, we compared two snakes that are of similar size. This thing is an absolute giant. And one way to easily identify a moccasin when it's fully adult like this, look at the banding right on the side of the face. Mario, see if you can zoom in on that there. Oh, wow, just bit the tongs, did you see that? Oh, okay, yeah. completely spun its body around. Go ahead and zoom in there, get a good shot. Let me get on my feet, he's a little closer than I'd yep. be when laying on the ground. Right? Now, if the snake does decide to take off, Mario and Mark, you both just get up and I'll, I'll get a hold of it with the tongs or, or get in front of it. There you go, now you can get a better idea of just how long this snake is. I'd say it's close to three and a half feet in length. Ooh, an incredibly dangerous snake. Now when I say this moccasin is big, it's almost an understatement. I wanna give you guys something for scale. What I'm gonna do is actually move the GoPro with the snake tongs in close to the snake. Oh, she struck right out at the camera. I guess he doesn't like GoPros. So you can have something in there for scale. Can you see that? Oh yeah. So that's a GoPro next to the head of that snake. The snake's head is almost as large as the GoPro is. When it comes to the girth of its body, I would say in circumference, it's probably close to six or seven inches and the length of the snake is around three to three and a half feet. This is without question the largest water moccasin I've ever seen. Now, as we know, the water moccasin has a very popular nickname, the cottonmouth. What they'll oftentimes do is curl up in a tight ball and then bend their head back and gape their mouth open. The inside of the mouth is bright white, just like a cotton ball. And as we know, that bright white coloration is aposematic, warning any predator that this bright color means that I am potentially toxic. Now, when you're talking copperheads versus water moccasins versus rattlesnakes, I would say that the water moccasin is pretty much right there in the middle when it comes to toxicity. Armed with a hemotoxic venom, and if you were bitten by this snake, there is no question about it, you were going to find yourself on the way to the hospital. All right, Mario, go ahead and zoom in on the snake's head. See how he's got his head positioned up like that and has a very triangular shape to it. Almost looks like the spade of a shovel, the front of a shovel. That signifies that this is a venomous snake. 
I know we've featured this snake species on the channel before, but most of those have been small to medium size. So as we were just driving out of the Everglades here and we saw the snake, we had to stop the vehicle, get the lights out, get the cameras, and get a couple of really cool shots. All right, that's exactly what we want right there. He says, curled himself up into a bit of a tighter ball. We're getting it. Oh. Oh. Okay, or he's ready to strike and he just completely bit down and wrapped his head around the snake tongs. Look at all Doused the venom on the tongs. The tongs. Let me get a shot of that real quick. That's crazy. Wow, that's a lot of venom. Yeah. Now you may be asking yourself, what is this snake doing in the center of the road like this at night? We actually just finished filming sunset B-roll shots. We're getting ready to drive ourselves out of the Everglades and here's this giant right in the middle of the road. What the snakes will do at night is come out and lay on the asphalt to warm up. Now the water moccasin is primarily a nocturnal species. So what's getting ready to do now is after it heats up, it's gonna head off into this underbrush and it's gonna begin hunting. Now, as a semi-aquatic pit viper, they have a really incredible opportunity to be in the water and hunting for things like fish and amphibians. Now, as compared to the other venomous pit vipers that we have in the United States, like rattlesnakes and copperheads, this is the only one that's actually capable of spending a significant amount of time in the water. Well, at this juncture, I think it's probably best that we gently move the snake off the side of the road so another car doesn't come and accidentally run it over. This is a pristine specimen when it comes to the quintessential water moccasin. How cool is this? Stumbling upon one of the most notorious pit vipers here in the Everglades. All right, buddy, let's move you off the road here. <laughs> Came right at me. All right, there we go. The snake is now safely on the side of the road. He's gonna disappear into the underbrush and continue his night of hunting. See you later, big guy. Of all the venomous snake species in the United States, it is a valid statement to say that the water moccasin is one of the most dangerous. They are quick striking and incredibly defensive if cornered. Their venom is not the most potent, however, when they deliver a bite, it usually comes with a powerful punch and a heavy yield of toxins that will most certainly send you to the hospital. It's important that you never try to catch or harass one of these snakes. And if you see one in the wild, remember that like all slithering reptiles, they simply want to be left alone. And if you walk in the opposite direction, your encounter with a notorious cottonmouth will be a completely safe one. Brave Wilderness has become culturally synonymous with animal bites and stings. In the name of science and entertainment, I've taken on my fair share of painful encounters. But some bites are far too dangerous when it comes to human trial. So that is where technology comes in. We have teamed up with Ohio HD, one of the Midwest's premier production houses. Renowned for their arsenal of high-end equipment, they are considered experts in executing creative ideas with specialized solutions. And today, we are combining our talents to bring you into the Strike Zone. On this episode, we're going to take you into the slow motion Strike Zone of the mangrove snake and the water moccasin. To capture these predator strikes, we will be using a phantom high-speed camera capable of capturing 1,000 frames per second at full 4K resolution. Then, by slowing down the footage, we will be able to closely analyze and break down why these strikes are so effective and ultimately lethal. Wow. Here we go. Also joining our party is the Bolt High-Speed Cinebot, which can go from standstill to high-speed motion in a fraction of a second. Yep, it's a robot with a camera for a head that can move faster than a human. Trust me, I was just as impressed as you are. Now before we enter the strike zone, first, let me introduce our fearless wildlife experts, Mario Aldecoa and Mike Easter. They will help to ensure that everything goes according to plan. Remember, safety for the animals and our crew is always the number one priority. There you have it, the cast of characters is set. So if you guys are ready, let the strikes begin. Okay, that's good. Let's turn it. 
So where we're gonna set this up is right here on this amazing tree branch sculpture. Now, Mario, are you setting up for somebody's birthday? No, it's no one's birthday. This is a prop. It is a balloon. And we are going to use this to entice a snake to strike out and hopefully pop the balloon in slow motion. Okay, what snake species is going to be striking at this balloon? We're gonna be using a mangrove snake. It is a mildly venomous colubrid from Southeast Asia. Okay, fingers crossed, let's see what happens. Oh, that's really good, all right? Yeah, this, this is gonna be it. This, of course, does not hurt the snake in any way. The only injury will come to the balloon. Okay, ready, 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 is that good? Yep. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was the one. That was it. Wow. Okay, so careful with your camera right there. The snake is still in strike pose. That was a good strike. That was pretty cool. That noise was loud inside of the studio, too. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've been waiting for, it's time to enter the strike zone. Okay, this is the moment. This is where we review the footage to find out if we got the strike. Man, the shot is crisp. Look at the snake. His mouth is already gaped open. Here comes the balloon into the shot. He's going. It seems like it lasts forever. I expect it to come so much quicker. Casey, nice. I see you're panning up. Yep. It's perfect. That's great. Yeah, you can actually see yeah. the teeth hanging down from the roof of his mouth. The anticipation. <laughs> a thousand frames so a second lasts a long time. Here comes the strike. Here, Here it comes. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> wow, that was incredible. Oh, oh that is one heck of a shot right there. Yeah. Dancing in the treetops is no challenge for this arboreal reptile. And what's more terrifying is that this killer usually hunts at night. Combining its excellent vision to pick up on even the slightest movement, it's then the snake's forked tongue that ultimately helps this lethal predator zero in and lock its strike. The S-shaped stance allows the reptile to spring forward, and if the strike is successful, it will hold on to the prey and begin to chew. Maneuvering the victim toward its rear fangs, where a mild venom is slowly injected. To humans, this bite is not fatal, but to birds, small mammals, and lizards, this is a very slow and agonizing end. All right, guys, water moccasin is coming on to set. Already got the gape going. Oh, already in strike pose. Oh, That's look at nice. that. We've got this log situation set up here, and the hopes is that the water moccasin is going to coil right here, and then we are going to slowly add in a warm water balloon and see if those heat-seeking pits are capable of striking out and giving us quite the show. I think this is going to work. Well, we got the mangrove snakes to strike. Supposedly water moccasins are a lot more aggressive. I think this is gonna work. Well, let's see some action. We want a water moccasin strike in slow-mo. Casey, how's that framing look for you? I'm feeling good here. Okay, Mike, we feel good about the snake? Feel good. Okay, and I think we're ready. Oh, oh. <laughs> wow, what just happened? He struck at the balloon. <laughs> I forgot about the water, actually. Wow. Oh, so yeah. with virtually insane speed, that snake struck out those fangs, hit the balloon, an explosion of air and water everywhere. That was going to be one very epic slow motion shot. You feel good about that, Casey? I love that. Oh, if Casey likes it, I like it. All right, uh, I say let's review the clip. This is it, reviewing the footage of the water moccasin strike. Look at that, tongue flicking in and out. Casey, this frame is absolutely oh. perfect. Here we go. Oh! oh. Wow. Boom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That water yeah, added an unbelievable effect. Dude, Boom. Casey, Boom. that might have been the best shot of the day right there. Distinguished by its stocky build and semi-aquatic nature, this New World Pit Viper is an accurately lethal striker. 
using heat-sensitive pits located between the eyes and nostrils, these sensory organs contain a network of thermal receptors that help detect the heat signatures of prey items. Even in complete darkness, the pits allow them to strike with incredible precision. And like a heat-seeking missile, their bite hits and delivers an explosion of hemotoxic venom. To any prey item, this hit is fatal. To humans, it's a race to the hospital. In slow motion, you can truly appreciate how fast and accurate the strike of a snake can be. It's not an experience you want to have, so remember, pay attention to your surroundings when out hiking, and if you come across a venomous snake, always admire it from a safe distance. It is early morning, and it is very similar to the conditions we had the other day when we visited this mechanic's property and unfortunately came across a dead black mamba. We've gotten a call, he has seen another mamba. So we are in fast pursuit to get out to this property as fast as we can so that the snake doesn't either A, kill another dog or get killed itself. Black mambas get a bad reputation as a snake species that will actually chase after you. That is never going to be the case with any animal. They're always gonna choose flight before fight. But most importantly, we need to keep ourselves safe because a bite from one of these animals is a medical emergency. Nothing comes close to the black mamba, just due to its size and just the immense speed of these snakes. So yeah, we're gonna try to avoid as much as possible having this human mamba conflict, especially with the guys, dogs and cats. So we're gonna try to get rid of this mamba and relocate it. So right now Tyrone is just flipping every piece of flat material that he can find anywhere this time of day that would be perfect for snakes to be hiding. Creepy abandoned building. Nest full of wasps. We're gonna keep moving. This is probably a needle in a haystack. Look at this. Especially a snake that's grayish, black in color. Talk about crazy camo. If <laughs> there was a mamba in here, we'll get on in there. Let's find that snake. Well, we've been searching for about 25 minutes now. I've not seen any snakes. I've seen a lot of other things. And it's usually when you're looking for a snake that you don't find a snake. They always surprise you. Ooh, that is creepy. Oh, it's like a rodent super highway back there. I don't know if you can see that. We got a snake. A snake? Where? Yeah, we got a snake. Is it a mama? It's a mama. We got a black mama. He's just under this little piece of tile. Snake! Hey, there's a yellow snake. What? There's a yellow snake. Hey! You got a snake? Is it the mamba? I think it's the mamba, man. Really, really, really? Where? Oh, man, in here? You saw it? Yeah, he's under there. He's a, he looks like a pretty big mamba. It is a mamba. It's definitely a mamba. Shoot, I hope there's no hole back there. I don't see anything. Yes, I do. I see a snake. Definitely see a snake back there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Dude, I think it's a mamba. Inspiration, we coloration. All right, um, mamba madness at its finest right here. That's a mamba. That is definitely a mamba. Tyrone, what is the play? Cool, so we're gonna just move some of the stuff that's sitting on top here. I'm gonna get a tongue on the snake. We're gonna get sort of about 50, 60 centimeters behind the head. And then we're gonna try to get another tongue on the snake just to secure it so the snake starts wriggling around, doesn't put any of us in danger. Okay. Yeah, so we're just gonna safely secure the snake and we're gonna go from there. We're just gonna have to be really agile. These snakes are really unpredictable, um, super defensive, so we just gotta be on high alert because this is top tier, the most dangerous snake in the country here. Okay, this is the worst case scenario because it's pinned into a corner. Yeah. The safest scenario for myself, the crew, and certainly the snake is gonna be to get it inside one of these tubes so we have control of the head. All right, I'm, I'm here on your command, so you let me know what you need me to do. Cool, so we're just gonna get on right to it. Now we're gonna move some of this Shrapnel out the way. Yeah, you can see the big coil of the snakes right coming out the back there. We've got a big, big mamba. Oh, man, yeah. Cool, we're going in hot. You want to lift it? Lift it. Yeah, let's lift. Yeah, we got a black mamba. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm going to grab it. Tongs on the snake. You can see he's puffing up his neck there slightly. It's a little narrow hood. One tongue is secure. 
We're gonna grab the secondary part of the snake here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool, the snake is secure. I'm coming out in the open area here. Wow. That's, cool. That is a big snake. Okay, so you want me to get the tubes? Yeah, let's get the tubes, Cody. Okay, uh, what do you think? Largest tube? Yeah, let's get with the largest tube. We're just gently restraining the snake. We don't wanna to put too much pressure on him. Get his head in there. Okay, he's going, he's going. Let him go, let him go a little bit more. I'm gonna, he's gonna reverse. Okay, oh. do, you want, do you want to grab it? Are you comfortable grabbing that? Just put him all the way up there. Let me know as okay. soon as you're comfortable. Yeah, I got a little, no, I'm not comfortable yet. Yeah, I've still got the tongs on it, they're safe. Okay. I, I, I want you to just put that back hand, so like completely holding the tube and that snake so he's yep. not gonna reverse, because he is gonna pull back. He is gonna pull back, okay. okay just, you don't think he can get out from there? No, as long as you've got a good grip on him. Tell me when you're comfortable, I'm gonna release the tongs. Okay, go ahead and release the tongs. This is no rocky moment. Okay, and I just you remember, he, he, is, he may try reverse, so if he does, just hold him quite in place there. Okay. You got him. Okay. Can I work him up a little bit further? Yeah, you can work him up a little further. <sighs> Good work. Oh, my hands are shaking at the moment. Wow, that is a very strong snake. Um, okay, we'll watch your face there, sorry. There we have it. That is a black mamba, safely tubed. Rather intense situation, but that went pretty smoothly. That's how we do it. We work safely. I catch my breath for a minute. My heart is racing. Okay, so the snake is staying pretty calm now. Um, let's go out of this enclosure and get ourselves in a spot that's a little more open. Uh, if for any reason I have to drop the snake and it comes out of the tube, we're in really close quarters. So uh, let's slowly move out. You guys move first. I'm gonna take it really, really slow. I got a really good, Good grip. Tyrone, you want to check my grip on the snake? You think that's Yeah, we're good there. Let's solid. just angle a little bit up, just in okay. case he shoots out. You got okay. it. Yeah, you got a good grip. Yeah, just, you want to sec yeah, secure the tail there, you're good, Code. Yeah. Man, this snake is insanely strong. Whoa! Man, it is intimidating to hold one of these snakes. Right now, just trying to calm my heart rate. There it is, the notorious black mamba. It's almost tough to put into words what it's like to hold on to a black mamba. This is a species that I have just read about for most of my life, always hoping that I would see one in the wild and not actually be hands-on with one, the most dangerous snake species I have ever physically interacted with. It is definitely a heart-racing encounter. Now, the black mamba, of course, gets its name from the black interior coloration of the mouth. And if I turn it like this and it opens up its mouth, we'll be able to get a really cool shot of that. The reason a bite from this snake is so potentially dangerous is because it is armed with a highly toxic, neurotoxic venom. If you're bitten by this snake, it begins to send your body into paralysis, which shuts down your major organs. So when your lungs, uh, your liver, your kidneys, and ultimately your heart begin to cease working, that's why a bite is so dangerous. Essentially, you just straight up go into paralysis and die. If you were ever bitten by a snake like this, it is an immediate medical emergency. Now, the big issue that we're looking at here today is the human-wildlife conflict. And people are terrified of the black mamba. Obviously, it has a negative reputation, but this is not a snake that is interested in interacting with humans. A dog was bitten. Unfortunately, that dog passed away, and the snake was killed in the process. You have that constantly happening out here, especially in rural areas. But these snakes are not to blame. We are in an area that is perfectly set up for snakes to be hunting for their food. You've got abandoned structures, you've got bags of garbage that has everything that would draw in rodents. Where you have rodents, you're going to have the reptiles that eat them. So the more you can do in your own yard to clean up the trash and make sure that you're not drawing in the prey items for these snakes, the less of your chance of actually seeing one of these snakes and ultimately interacting with it. So the last aspect to today's snake rescue is to actually relocate this snake to a place that's far away from human habitation. That will give the better chances for this snake to live out the length of its life, and of course will keep the dogs and the humans in this area completely safe. Now, is this a resident mamba that we were told about? It's possible, it is pretty sizable, but when you live in an area like this, there's always going to be another snake. So you can see why the work that Tyrone does is so incredibly important here in South Africa. And a big thanks to him for taking us out on this rescue mission. I feel completely fulfilled in that we have finally found one of these snakes that we were able to rescue. It didn't lose its life. And uh, we're doing a good thing for the environment by getting this predator back out to where it belongs. I'm Coyote Peterson, be brave.
stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Okay, we found a pretty cool spot to release the mamba. We are way back off some dirt road and we have found a beautiful dry riverbed. It is just perfect mamba habitat. Grasses, trees, likely a lot of food. So uh, we're gonna get the snake out and this is another success story for Tyrone in successfully rescuing and relocating a venomous snake.